Okay. Well, I'm Linda Moss Vines, and we're here tonight to talk about Russia and the Ukraine. And I have to do sort of a disclaimer at the beginning. I, those of you that know me, most of you probably know me more as an American historian because I've done, I taught American history for 45 years. A lot of folks don't know, though, that undergraduate, I was really a European history person, and I did spend 27 years simultaneously with the 45 years. You know, I'm not 93 just yet. Um, I did teach AP European history and have had a fascination with Russia, honestly, since I was a young girl. Now, I have to tell you, I'm a product of the Cold War. So, you know, I'm one of those people who grew up constantly hearing about the Soviet Union, hearing about Russia, and I was fascinated to understand Russian history. And as an undergraduate, spent three semesters just on Russian history and then two semesters on U USSR history. And we're going to pretty much do all of that in one hour tonight. So, <laughs> you know, go figure. But I, it's fascinating for me, and I do have to do a disclaimer. You know, as someone who loves this country, who is prideful of the fact that we have a representative democracy, which is a republic, where we elect officials, where we are active participants in our government, I have to tell you as a preface to all of this, that has never been the pattern in Russia. Not from the ancient days, not through Tsarist Russia, not through the Soviet Union, and not even since the fall of the Soviet Union and the Yeltsin era to the modern. So I think sometimes we become incredibly frustrated rightly so, but we become, um, it's very difficult for us to look as, as things unfold and understand the patterns of behavior. And that's because we're looking at it through the lens of a government that even as flawed as we are at times, has a respect for individual rights, individual responsibility, the rule of law. All of this has come home much more clearly for me because, and he may come wondering in in a moment, but my son-in-law <coughs> is first generation. Parents both independently fled communist Eastern Europe in the 60s and then his mother in the 70s. And to be able to share with my family that history of what it really looked like from their side, having been free peoples in Greece and then in Armenia and to have had their lives changed by what happened in the Soviet Union. So we're going to do a really quick sort of look at all of that tonight. So I put up a map because sometimes I'll have folks say, okay, I know where Russia is. Where's the Ukraine? Well, Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, the Ukraine, you can see, is the green country with the dimple hanging down into the Black Sea. That's the Crimean Peninsula, and we'll be talking about that quite a bit. Russia is brown. One of the things that, that, and we can go on to the first slide whenever you want to, Christina, but one of the things that I would run into lots of times when I would be traveling and talking about Russian history is that people 30 or 40 years ago in particular would think of Russia as being an Asian country because it's on the Asian continent. It is not. It is by language, culture, tradition, religion, and Everything else about it, it is a European nation. It is Eastern European, but historically, it is a European nation and has been actively engaged in interaction with Europe since the 1300s. You know, very few countries were interacting with other countries at all until the end of the, the Middle Ages, until the high Middle Ages. So, if you look, what you begin to realize when we look at Russia and talk about its interaction with the rest of the world, and you'll hear this repeated tonight as I try to move really, really quickly. It's always dangerous to invite historians to talk because we like to talk and we like to share stuff. You know, occasionally my daughter will say, Mom, that person was actually saying hello and just mentioned something about history and you went <laughs> full force on the street corner into talking about something. So she we have this thing now where she'll go, <clears throat> and that means I'm to hush. I have told Christina to do that when I need to hush tonight. Russia, Russia's interaction with the rest of the world, quite frankly, comes down to access to trade, access to commerce, access to interaction with other nations. 
And historically, that has meant access to warm water, which they do not have historically. Their only major seaport historically was Archangel, which you don't see on the map, but Archangel is on the Arctic Sea. It's up at the very top of the Russian map. And that port is only open two months out of the year. And so for Russia to become a modern nation, to become a world power, and in their plan to become a dominant world power, access to warm water has motivated a lot of what's happened. Now we're going to do sort of a real quick run through Russian history because you sort of have to get into the mindset of what has motivated the Russian political scene historically. And, and let me also mention to you, remember we're talking about governments, we're not talking about people. The Russian people have very little to do with the way in which their government has interacted with the rest of the world. The truth of the matter is that's true in a lot of nations, but especially in a nation that has historically been autocratic, uh, has been absolute as monarchy, monarchy, and then comes out of that and into a period of communist regime, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So, next slide. So, a lot of words up there. I, I don't expect you to read all of that, but a lot up there just to kind of help you remember that Really, the very first Russian state that we find talked about very much in history occurs in the ninth century, that's the 10 hundreds, and it is what at that time was called Kievan Rus. That point on the map was considered to be Russian, but it is in what today is defined as the boundaries of the Ukraine. And some of you saw my post on Facebook, I guess at the end of last week and when all of this began to unfold, and it is you know, it's one of those historic things where you have Russia claiming as its birthplace and the Ukraine claiming as its birthplace the same dot on the map. So who has control? And the best analogy I can give you for that is think of the number of wars that have been fought over Jerusalem, which is conceived, is believed, is justifiably believed, to be the birthplace of three major world religions. And think of the wars that have been fought over that. What you see occurring between Russia and the Ukraine historically begins with, it's the birthplace of whose nation? What nation? And that's so true. You know, you have the rise of the Golden Age in the 10th century, and you have Orthodoxy Christianity adopted at that point early on, Orthodoxy Christian, actually, Armenia is the, was the first nation to be recognized as a Christian nation, and they are Eastern European, and they will at one point be absorbed into the Soviet Union, into Russia. Notice 11th century, Kiev, Russia, becomes the center of Eastern European politically, culturally, and all of that. Between the 13th and the 15th century, you have the Mongol invaders. All you remember the Mongols from when you were in school? The thundering hordes galloping across the steppes of of Eastern Europe and just pretty much destroying everything in its path. That happens to Russia also. But notice by the 15th century, the Muscovite princes, Moscow being their headquarters, begin what they see as a campaign to gather all the Russian lands. And there begins what will occur for the next seven centuries. How do you define the Russian lands? The Russian definition will be anyone who is Eastern European Slavic, who has at any point ever been a part of the Russian Empire, is indeed then Russian lands, Russian peoples. Some of those peoples do not agree with that definition. So it becomes really, really interesting. Notice it's during that period of time that Ivan III comes to the czar, come, becomes czar, comes to the throne, and he, and I love, because history books always say he subdued all opposition. What do you think subdued means? <laughs> Kill. Kill. You know, ch -ch 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 you know, and you learn after a while that if you are the opposition, you need to be subtle in your opposition. You need to be discreet. You need to be stealth. You know, you need to be sneaky. I'm from the plateau. We would say sneaky. You just need to figure out how to do it because there's pretty much a pattern of behavior that will occur within this autocracy, 
within. This is not a benevolent monarchy. This is not any of that. This is a total control autocracy. Good example, 16th century, Ivan the Terrible was probably the first person most of us remember when we talk about Russian history. And Ivan the Terrible, he actually gives himself that name because that's what he heard his subjects calling him because he was so ruthless. But he gloried in that because what it meant was people didn't challenge him. Um, I use it as an example. He's the first one to really use the word czar. And remember the Russians spell czar, not that anybody cares about this, but I just find it interesting. They spell it T-S-A-R. When I was a child growing up, whenever I saw czar written, it was C-Z-A-R. That's, that's the Western European use of Caesar as the idea of an all-controlling monarch. And so we, it's almost like anglicizing a name. And we changed it, but it's T-S-A-R. I've been the terrible, my best example that I, I love to give to show you that he is worthy of the title of terrible. How many of you know St. Basil's Cathedral? It's probably the most famous structure in Russia. You know, it's the beautiful one with the towers that look like turbans and everything. It's Ivan the Terrible who commissions St. Basil's Cathedral, and I do objectively believe it's probably one of the five most beautiful beautiful architectural wonders in the world. When it was completed, Ivan had a festival, and he invited all of the dignitaries in Russia and Moscow at that point to come to the festival. He invited the architect who had designed it and overseen its construction to come to the festival, telling him that he had a great gift for him because this was the most beautiful building in the world. Uh, the architect assumed that the gift was he was going to have a lovely medallion, perhaps a pension for life. Instead, what Ivan did was he used a wooden stick, which he had heated in the coals to burn his eyes out, so that he would never be able to construct another building that would in any way be comparable to St. Basil's Cathedral. I'm thinking that's pretty much a good definition of someone who's willing to do whatever is necessary to maintain control of his nation state, his political boundary, and his nation being his people. Next slide. 1613, Russia goes through a, a time that's known as the time of troubles at the end of the 16th century going into the 17th century, and they come together with a compromise and they choose a young man from the Romanov family to become czar. Michael Romanov becomes the first czar and he is chosen by a national council of, of Russian lords. And the Romanov dynasty, dynasty most of you will recognize because they will rule until 1917 when Nicholas II and his entire family will be executed by the Bolsheviks. But that's what yeah. Michael looks like. He's, he looks a little more attractive. Doesn't look quite as frightening. And that's because he really wasn't. He also didn't have much control of the government because it was indeed the Russian lords controlling. So then we move forward to our next slide and next couple of centuries. We're going to do five centuries in ten minutes. We're doing really well. Uh, the next two centuries, I wish I had enough time we could sort of wallow in Peter the Great because Peter the Great it's fascinating. Any of you read Robert Massey's book, Peter the Great, all 730-something pages of it or whatever? There was one year when I required it as the required summer reading for my students, and I thought perhaps we were going to have a Bolshevik revolt. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was fascinating. It was like, oh my gosh, let me read the next chapter. Well, Peter is, he's sort of like the uh, tale of two cities of Russian history. It was the best of all times, and it was the worst of all times. He is this wonderful reformer in that he, tra he travels to Europe to try and see what's going on in Western Europe. He's traveling incognito. And I, I always pause when I say that because he's six foot seven and he travels with an entourage of 200. <laughs> so <laughs> traveling incognito, but he's in, he travels in workers' clothes. He doesn't want to look like he's the czar. He wants to see what's going on in Europe because this is the height of the Enlightenment. He spends time in the Netherlands learning how to build ships, and, and he goes to France, and he sees what's going on with the Enlightenment philosophies there. He visits England. 
you know, the, the early, early, early stages of industrialization, not the way we think of it today, but you know, the rising middle class, and then he goes back to Russia, and he does all of these wonderful things. He creates schools, he creates a court system, he creates a rule of law, sort of, for those people who are wealthy and who will do what he really wants them to do. But I mean, and the schools he does academic schools, and he does, does vocational technical schools. He, uh, you know, he modernizes the navy. He creates a really strong army. Everyone knew he would create an army because when, when he was a young boy, his father gave him a number of serfs to be his soldiers, and he would play war with his serfs out in the fields of the palace with real little boys and they would stage war and everything. So we always knew he had this military sense. But he also wants Russia to become the dominant power in Eastern Europe. Now technically Eastern Europe includes Poland. I love Poland, but bless its heart. Poland's, there was a short period of time where Poland was sort of with it, but then yeah, the rest of the world found out Poland was the flat land of Northern Europe and it was the ideal place for armies to cross and the poor Poles keep multiple flags in their closets and it's kind of like, whose army's coming, run the flag up, you know, so they won't kill us or whatever. It's Prussia at that point, it's Austria, it's Hungary, but they were not particularly modernized, they were still serf nations just like Russia is. So he's wanting to be the rising power in Eastern Europe, and that means being able to have access to Europe, to trade with Europe, to get ideas from Europe, to share Russian glories with Europe. So you'll notice it is Peter who first grabs what we call today the Baltic provinces, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, because remember, how's he going to trade? We don't have railroads at this point. We don't have airplanes. We don't have telephones, television, telegraphs, any of that sort of stuff. Everything pretty much is by water or land trade. And land is difficult. And if you've looked at the vastness of Russia on a map and how much of it is unoccupied Russia when you head eastward in Russia to Siberia, to, you know, toward where Vladivostok is today in that area. So he grabs Estonia and Latvia first. That's where he builds St. Petersburg, his capital, and in his humility, of course he names it after himself, people will say, oh, that's so sweet, he names it for St. Peter. Uh, no, he names it for himself. You know, St. Peter was probably like, there went my chance. He conquers the Crimean, and the Crimean Peninsula is incredibly valuable because that gives Russia access to the Black Sea and coming out of the Black Sea, then you can come through the Dardanelles and you can come down then into the Mediterranean eventually. It's not an easy path, but it's warm water. So he gets Crimea, he takes Ukraine. This is the end of the 1600s. Ukraine was grabbed. It's an independent country until that point. He grabs Georgia, the Georgia that is next door to Ukraine. He grabs what today we would know as Belarus, Moldavia, Eastern Poland. Uh, Catherine the Great, by this point, comes to the throne, and Catherine the Great, along with the Prussians and the Austrians, Poland disappears off the map three different times at the end of the 18th century. They just disappear. It's so much fun. I love maps. Anybody love maps? <laughs> Oh my gosh, you can learn so much about history and maps. And I used to just throw that map up and I'd go, where's Poland? And people would go, well, it's right there. And I'd go, well, the Polish people are right there. And the Polish towns are right there, but it's not Poland any longer. You know, how does a nation the size of Poland disappear off the map when you are surrounded by land hungry, highly politically motivated monarchs who want what you have, which is rich, fertile, agricultural land. One thing we all have to do is what you're probably going to do when you leave here. We all have to eat. Notice he's attempting to become an equal player. The Russians are attempting to become an equal player. Um, how many of you remember your, your history of the French Revolution? So I said, you two should. <laughs> I've got a couple of former students back there. I know they know this stuff. <laughs> well, you know, 
the Russian, the, the French Revolution is going fairly well, you know, for the first six months or so until they really get into it. And, you know, they have the National Assembly, and then there's all this stuff, and then they go into, you know, the four phases of the French Revolution. There's the first of calling to the Estates General. Second phase is the Reign of Terror, which we all look at and go, oh, well, that went really bad really quickly. You know, we didn't do that in our American Revolution, but, you know, within a period of about 18 months, about 30,000 people are guillotined. Can't you hear that sound in your mind, that sort of whoosh, from the guillotine? Third phase is the Thermidorian reaction where the French all sort of look at each other and go, what the heck have we just done? How did we lose control? What is there about mob behavior that we forget what we're doing? And they decide that they want to restore order, and in doing so, Napoleon comes to power. And, you know, I laugh sometimes and I say, Louis XVI was sort of an inept monarch who never really had control of the French government. So they replace him with his nephew by marriage, Napoleon, who is married to Marie Antoinette's brother's daughter. <laughs> Family trees in Europe are so much fun. And Napoleon then decides he's going to, not only is he going to rule France, but he's going to conquer all of Europe and create the French Empire. And he does a really good job from 1803 when he declares himself to be emperor for life, crowning himself on the steps of the Notre Dame. You know, the church I was raised in, I would have been really fearful that a bolt of lightning would have probably come out of the heavens and fried my hair curly at that point. But <laughs> Napoleon is not frightened until 1812 when he decides, because Russia has broken the continental system and Russia is trying to trade with Great Britain, that he's going to go to Russia and punish them. Let me tell you, the second great rule in history, never invade Russia. Never invade Russia. I'm here to tell you, had Hitler studied history, he would have never invaded Russia, which is sort of his death knell, thank God, but still. Um, and it will be the Russians who will be the downfall of Napoleon because what Napoleon didn't realize, he leaves Paris with 500,000 men. He plans that they will march to Moscow in six weeks. <coughs> I'm about to make a sexist statement, folks. There is no woman in her right mind who would ever believe that she could get 500,000 men, supplies, horses, munitions, guns. It's all we can do to get a family to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> but he thinks he's going to get there in six weeks. And that doesn't happen. They enter Moscow in the winter with the snows on the ground. And the Russian people, who are not well armed to put them off, but the Russian people are so determined because of their ruler at that point, who is Alexander I, that they burn the city rather than allow Napoleon to take them. You need to remember that. They're willing to do some very serious stuff to be able to be victorious. So. You know, during that same period of time, you've got the Russians coming out of that, and by the 1850s, the Crimean War occurs. Now, how many of you remember the Crimean War from history? I am so impressed, because I'm here to tell you that when I was teaching it fast like this, we would sort of go, there was a Crimean War. In a really strange sort of turn of events, England and France are allied with the Ottoman Empire against Russia. Because the enemy of my enemy is my friend, in this instance, because the last thing that you want if you're Great Britain and you're the dominant power in the world in the 1850s, and France, who is the wannabe, tag along is you want somebody else to become the dominant power, so you chop them off at the knees, and you're willing to ally with the Ottoman Empire. And we fight the Crimean War, which most people only remember because they remember Alfred Lord Tennyson's The Charge of the Light Brigade into the Valley of Death Road, the 600, you know, to the left of me, to the right of me. Ah, it's wonderful. And they remember Florence Nightingale. It's the first time that you have women nursing on the battlefield. Up until that point, you had sort of core, um, medical core, and they were always men because women, heaven forbid that a woman should see the semi-naked body of a man because she was probably just going to die right there on the spot and be of no help whatsoever to <laughs> not get a sort of change of some of that. But there's all sorts, you know, when you have everybody kind of gang up against Russia in the 1850, you have, at that point, it's Alexander II comes into power in 1856, not that you need to remember that, but 
but Alexander II is really the semi-good guy in the 19th century. And everybody's ganged up on Russia. You have the Russians adopting an attitude that says it's pretty much up to us to create our own destiny, and those who are our allies today may not be our allies tomorrow, so don't trust anybody. And that becomes the mantra. So, uh, by the way, that's Peter the Great on the top. That's his favorite portrait. And if you could look closely, he is pointing to a map, and he is pointing to a map that shows the Black Sea. Just, you know, there are subtle things you want in portraits. He wants everyone to know, and that's Catherine at the bottom, you know, in, in just sort of a casual day outfit. <laughs> you know, it's kind of cool. Um, then, let's move real quickly. I have no idea what time it is because that clock is killing me. It's six. All right, we're, we're moving. Okay, so we get to Alexander the Third. To understand Alexander the Third, I'm going to real quickly tell you about Alexander the Second. Alexander the Second comes to power in the 1850s. Alexander II considers himself to be basically an enlightened man, and so his plan is that he is gradually going to free the Serbs. He is gradually going to move the people to where they can have a constitution. He's gradually going to allow people at some point to have the vote. He's going to end serfdom. He's going to do all these wonderful things. People don't, you know, once he begins to talk about it, people want immediate change. And what you'll notice is that by 1881, Alexander, and one of those weird little things that happens in history, Alexander II is ready to sign a constitution. But those who are tired of waiting, a nihilist movement basically comes together and they decide they create a plot to assassinate Alexander II. In a you know, it's in those weird sorts of things that happen in history. Alexander II is leaving a meeting in which he has inked the first step toward a constitution that will change everything in Russia. And as he leaves the meeting, the nihilists roll a bomb under his carriage, which blows his carriage up and separates his torso from his legs, and he dies on the spot. You didn't need to know the gruesome part. I just find that really interesting. <laughs> you know, gives you an idea of what they're willing to do. His son, Alexander III, comes to the throne. And of course, what is Alexander III's reaction? See, I knew you couldn't trust those lousy peasants, sirs. Look at that. Their dad was, I always thought he was too soft. He was too trusting. He was too, yeah, yeah, talking about philosophy all the time. What we need are military. We need guns. We need weapons. We need to whip the people into shape. Isn't it funny how parents, in some ways, in the most bizarre ways historically, influence the behavior of their children to do the exact opposite of what they themselves really wanted? And they don't always wake up and realize it until it's too late. So Alexander III comes to, to be czar. And you look at him, and he looks like a pretty normal guy, right? Wrong. <laughs> it's Alexander III who puts all the Jewish population into the pogroms. It is Alexander III who will, you know, will basically wage war on every ethnic minority in what at that point is the Russian Empire. It has three major plans. Autocracy, I rule alone. That's it. I don't need advisors. He has a few advisors, but he pays no attention to them. He rules alone. It is orthodoxy. Everybody will be Russian Orthodox. If you don't want to be Russian Orthodox, then guess what? You can figure out where you're going to be in the afterlife because I'm sitting you there. <laughs> and that's what he does. And russification. If you are an ethnic minority, it doesn't matter if you are a Cossack, if you're Ukrainian, if you're Belarusian, if you're Georgian or whatever, your language is outlawed. You can't read the literature of your culture. No poetry, no ethnic music, anything that gives you cultural identity now must be Russian. Only Russian artists, only Russian music, only Russian literature, everything. Everyone else's culture is to be destroyed. That's what you do when you want to whip your ethnic minorities into line. You either kill them or you, what is it the Borg say? 
Resistance is futile. Resistance is futile. <laughs> you become part of the collective. Uh, Alexander dies in 1894. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were a few people in history that we I used to sort of clap, which is a terrible thing to do. Actually, I used to be very happy when John Marshall finally would die, only in teaching American history because he was on the Supreme Court for so long. It was sort of like Marshall's done something else, or Henry Clay. But with with what you see with Alexander III, who resisted Alexander III the most? It was the Ukrainians. They were just stubborn, stubborn people. How many of you have seen the picture within the last week? of the Ukrainian president and with his body armor on when they said, you know, Mr. President, you need to flee. They're about to come into the city. And he basically said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay here and kick butt and take names <laughs> or something to the extent of that. Notice it's the Ukrainians who respond. Do they do away with all of their cultural literature, their music, all of that? They actually have a cultural reawakening. You know, I've always told folks I'm predominantly Scotch-Irish, and I am convinced that the reason there are so many Scots and Irish who fought in the American Revolution, the War of 1812, every major war is all we needed to motivate us was someone to say, you will not, and we were sort of like, hide and watch. That's the Ukrainians. You think we're going to go quietly into this good night? Little Dylan Thomas there. <laughs> go quietly into this night, uh-uh, we're not going to do it. So they don't. And who is most punished of all the ethnic groups? The Ukrainians. Because they wouldn't. They wouldn't become what they were mandated to become. Um, we'll move on real, real quickly. So what else do you need to know about Ukraine? Well. During the Russo-Turkish War, there's another war in the 1870s. It's not really important except that the Ukrainians will fight on the side of the Turks against Russia because it's all for control of the Crimea, which is theirs, and the Black Sea. Uh, Russia begins to look for other outlets for warm water. You know, they, they're trying to maintain control of the Baltic. They're looking at the Black Sea. They begin to look at the Pacific. Well, the Pacific is a long way away from where the centers of population are but they will build the Trans-Siberian Railroad. It will run from Moscow all the way to Vladivostok. Don't you just love to say Vladivostok? Isn't that a fun name to say? I kind of like that. I, I need to be able to do that more. The only problem is, of course, they try to subdue Manchuria, which is under control of the Japanese, so they make the Japanese really, really angry. And you're going to find that historically, for a period of time, the Japanese and the Russians are going to be fighting each other often over the Sakhalin Islands, which is a, a fishing area off the coast of Russia. We don't have time. I started to say, there will be a Russo-Japanese war in which, you know, everyone's got, oh my gosh, the Russians are fighting the Japanese. Poor, poor Japanese. Turn of the 20th century, the Japanese lay waste to the Russians, and Teddy Roosevelt actually negotiates the peace treaty. We're always involved in things. Uh, <laughs> You'll notice 1914, it is Russia's involvement in the Balkans that really contributes to the beginning of the Great War. Oh, if we just had time to talk about the Great War. But you'll remember that the Serbians assassinate Franz Ferdinand. Not a big deal. I mean, nobody particularly liked Franz Ferdinand, except, of course, he was the crown prince who was going to come to power in Austria when Franz Joseph, who had been on the throne since, listen to this, 1848, and it's 1913, and Franz Ferdinand, who is his great, great nephew, that gives you an idea of how many people were disappointed that Franz Joseph had not died earlier. Uh, when he is assassinated, the Russians get involved because the Serbians are Slavs. And Russia considers itself to be the protector of all Slavs in the Balkan. So when the Serbs are in when the Serbs are forced to take responsibility for the assassination, and the Germans support the Austrians, the Russians actually mobilize their forces first. They're headed toward Germany. And then, of course, everybody else gets involved, and we fight. 
for a whopping altogether, you know, from 1914, really, when the first shots are fired until 1918, and when it's all over, over everybody's going, what was that all about? Why did we do that? You know, and, and Germany ends up being the bad guy when they actually were not the ones who started it, but nonetheless, they were practicing. Um, it is the Great War, what we call today World War I, it will lead to the Russian Revolution, which then will put us into another chapter of Russian history. Because Nicholas II, bless his heart, um, who looks enough like George, King of England at that point, I mean, they could be twin brothers, but they are actually second cousins on four different lines. <coughs> cousins always make great spouses. <laughs> but history tells us. So, you know, they're all sort of intermingled. But Nicholas was not a particularly good uh, ruler at that point. He had promised a constitution, promised a constitution. There's all sorts of upheaval in Russia. And then World War I breaks out. The Russians are part of the, the alliance agreements, and they're going to support France and Great Britain. And, and Nicholas sends the Russian army off, but not often very well armed. Many of them had weapons, but they had no munitions. In simple Tennessee terms, they had guns but no bullets. And what he told them was, you know, if you get into a battle, fix your bayonets. <laughs> well, that worked really well in the 16th and 17th century when everybody else was pretty much low on munitions and, you, you know, you were fighting with powder and you fixed your bayonets and you did a charge. That doesn't work really well with needle guns. That doesn't work very well when you have aircraft involved, when you have poison gases and everything, and you have Russian troops. We estimate the Russians lost about 20 million people during the Great War. Most of those are civilian deaths. Starvation is not just people fighting on the front, but it's starvation, it's disease. There was no money to take care of anything. And they lost whatever claim they've had to pass glory because they performed so poorly in the battle that that's a contributing factor to the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, when Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky are able to rise up and overthrow the government, and you end up with the Russian Civil War. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the Russian Civil War other than to say, once the Bolsheviks take control of the Russian government, they imprison Nicholas II, Alexandria, his wife, the the princesses and the, the crown prince, but there's a division among those who are socialists. You know, Lenin creates what he calls Leninist Marxism, which is an adaptation of Karl Marx's philosophy. There were socialists who wanted to stay strictly with what Karl Marx had said. So, you know, they, they've thrown out the emperor, the czar, but now they're fighting among themselves as to what they're going to have and we erupt into a civil war. Why do you need to care about that? In the scheme of things, you could probably die happy someday and not know much about the Russian Civil War, except it's a really scary time for the rest of the world for two reasons. To have instability in the Russian Empire is in itself scary, because you don't know what they're going to do. And two, we're talking about socialism, Marxism, communism, whatever label you want to put on it. And knowing what Karl Marx had said, workers of the world, rise, unite, throw off the chains that enslave you, everyone thinks that it's going to be exported to the rest of the world, that revolution. The Civil War, the Reds versus the Whites. By the way, how many of you have read C.S. Lewis and the Tales of Narnia and all of that? It really is. But it, it uses the Russian Civil War so as an, an analogy for a lot of other things. But what you have are the Bolsheviks with those who are allied with them against the Mensheviks, the whites, and the ethnic minorities who know what's going to happen to them. But Britain sends troops. Japan sends troops. How many of you knew the United States sent troops to fight with the white army? So you guys are great. Most groups I go into, they'll go, wait, we fought in the Russian Civil War? Yeah, the general population at that time probably didn't know it, but we sent 12,500 armed soldiers to be a part of that. And ultimately, of course, what happens is the Reds win, and the ethnic minorities, we're going to move quickly here, so All right. real quickly. <laughs> Stalin, bad. <laughs> 
we can sort of do that. Uh, we, we moved by 1922 into the USSR. The ethnic minorities are forced to become part of the USSR. They have the lovely title of being the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, but they are dominated by Russia, which capital is Moscow. And you find just absolute no, no vocal expression allowed for those minorities, no control of their own destiny, any of that. The Ukrainians were the most resistant to Stalin's plans, and you'll notice what Stalin does, because they will no, not go along with him when he wants to create collective farms. He has these series of five-year plans in which Russia is going to take over the world, and everything. the Ukrainians basically go, you know, we're not going to be a part of that, and he systematically starves the Ukrainians to death. Another, we estimate 10 to 15 million Ukrainians will starve to death during that one period of time. And when they still will not give in, he moves ethnic Russians into Ukrainian. That's important for what you hear today when you hear President Putin talking about, but there are Russians there. Yes, they are. Um, many of them were relieved, relocated there in the 1930s, and there has been a systematic attempt to dominate the Ukrainians by putting Russians there since then. It's sort of like, and I can say this being Scotch-Irish, it's sort of like what the Presbyterian Scots did in Ireland when they moved into Northern Ireland to convert the heathen Catholics <laughs> under the auspices of Cromwell. We can do some English history sometimes. But too. it really is in Eastern Ukraine that most of the Russians defend themselves too. It is, and the two provinces that broke off, and, and I'm moving quickly, Chris. Uh, Cold War era, very little expression for the Ukraine. Everything is controlled by Moscow. I have to tell you, as a young person, even in high school during the Cold War, even in college, even when I began teaching, I never thought, when I thought of the USSR, I only thought of Moscow. I thought of the USSR as Russia. Now, I knew from an intellectual standpoint there were all those other nations, including Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Armenia, Quick question, because we have to keep moving. Why do you think the Soviets were in Afghanistan? They were there before we were there. They were there because the Persian Gulf gave them another outlet to water. And they thought the Afghanis, still being tribal people, would be easily overcome. They found out that was not true. Unfortunately, we had found out that was not true also. Um, we had we actually paid attention to what happened to the Russians, and this is not a criticism of foreign policy, it's just that nobody reads the history books. And those of us who do sort of sit to the side and go, oh, not a good idea, not a good idea. Um, Cold War era, you know, we, we go through a series of leaders. You know, Stalin is there until 1952, from 1924 when Lenin dies, and Stalin comes over. By the way, Stalin, in the purges, Another 20 million people across Russia are going to be killed because anyone who had known Lenin, killed. Anyone who had served in the Russian army, lieutenant or above, summarily executed because Trotsky had been the one who had led the Red Army during the Civil War and he was the great military strategist. Stalin will actually have Trotsky chased all the way to Mexico and will have him killed there at his fleet by having an ice pick driven through his ear while he's sleeping at the house of Diego Rivera and Frida. So, you know, the socialists all hang out together too, like those of us who like history. Uh, how many of you remember Khrushchev? Oh, yeah. Brezhnev? Yeah. And Dropoff? Yeah. Kosinko? Yeah, you know, after a while it's kind of like it's another one of those people with vowels at the end of their name. Eh, they're all the same. Cold War? Oppression. We're going to move quickly. So let's get to sort of modern things. And I may actually. So Gorbachev comes into power as the president of the Soviet Union. And Gorbachev is, is a Russian leader of a different ilk. You know, he comes out with perestroika and glass knives. We're going to have openness. We're going to have truth. We're going to talk about things. And of course, it leads to the collapse of the Soviet Union because once he began to open those floodgates, People are pouring through, and I don't mean literally, but as, as people are given a voice, they rise up. Soviet Union collapses. He's pr 
president of the Soviet Union. He's not president of Russia. Suddenly, he doesn't have a job. We give him a job teaching at Princeton. He comes to the United States eventually, and then we will, next slide, the person up, the person that will come up on the screen next, and we'll, but we'll talk about real quickly how it kind of all, all unfolds. Yeltsin is president of Russia, but the presidents of the different provinces all, in theory, reported to the Communist Party Secretary General, and that was Gorbachev, who was also technically president of the USSR. So notice 1991, as the Soviet Union has collapsed, Ukraine declares its independence. And you have a number of the Christian Tartars who return to the Crimea in support of Ukraine. You have presidential elections in 1994, and they elect a person with Western-leaning Western views. Someone there, they are really looking for a representative government in some form. 1996, they adopt a democratic constitution, and that's democratic with a small d. Whenever you see the large d, that means socialist. They, they create a democratic constitution, and in May of 2002, the Ukraine announces that they want to join NATO. So what do you think is the reaction in the Russians to the Ukraine wanting to join NATO? They lose their ever-loving mind. <laughs> I mean, really, we all know what NATO is, right? North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's sort of like the Three Musketeers. Somebody attacks you, I'll come to your defense. Someone attacks me, I'll come to... You'll come to my defense. Somehow I need to get covered in all of this. And the idea that the Ukraine would become a NATO member, that's a little too close to comfort for the Russians. So Yeltsin, I think the next picture is Yeltsin, maybe. Oh, I, I took Yeltsin out because I knew I would run out of time. So anyway, ah, Yeltsin is in power through all of that. And then the person who will come into play, because he will be brought in, and I think I have it included here. Yeah, December 1999, Putin becomes acting president. But prior to that, the one thing I want all of you to remember when you look at Vladimir Putin is that he came into power as the head of the KGB. He was the head of the KGB, and he worked his way up to be the head from his first job was spying on foreigners who came to Russia. Then he spied on anyone in Eastern Europe who might be adversarial toward Russia. Then he had control of all of Europe. Then he comes on to Yeltsin's staff. He realizes the path to power is not just being a spy master. He needs a real position. And you'll notice quickly, he becomes Yeltsin's first deputy, then he becomes chief of staff, then he's director of federal security, which is the new KGB. Then he becomes secretary of the Security Council, then he becomes prime minister. Then Yeltsin suddenly resigns. You know, the Western press is like, is he sick? Is he drunk? You know, what's going on? And Putin comes to power. And he comes to power as the acting president in December, by March the 26th, he's elected as president. He'll serve two terms. The Russian Constitution at that point said you could serve two terms and then you could not succeed yourself. So his deputy prime minister, a guy by the name of Dmitry Mendevov, so much easier to say when you look at it on paper, Mendevov, <laughs> becomes president and his first act is to appoint Putin as his prime minister. John Quincy <coughs> Adams and Henry Clay, people, I'm telling you, there are deals like that all the time. Putin will serve as prime minister for four years. In 2012, he will become president of Russia again. And the constitution will be changed. And guess who's still in charge of Russia? Do we think he's going to go anywhere? Probably not. You know, he has some, some goals. Um, what he has announced, and if you listen very closely, he has announced that what Russia simply wants to do, Russia is being benevolent, it simply wants to bring all Russians back together. Um, the last time I really heard someone say that in history, it was Adolf Hitler justifying the annexation of Austria, the Sudetenland, and breathing space for the Germans. 
Anytime you hear someone say that from a historical standpoint, I'm not a predictor of the future, but when you hear someone say that, you need to be frightened. Um, so what about those areas of land where Slavic Russians share land with other Slavs who are not Russian ethnically? Their ethnicity is not the same. What happens? And, and what we know from what Putin has said, they simply will become minorities in Russian-controlled territories. The Ukraine has always been the first target, quite frankly, because of its incredible position. It is close to the European theater. It controls the Crimean, or it did until 2014, and that'll be the last thing we'll look at. How many of you remember that Putin stormed in in 2014 and took the Crimean? We were all so incredibly upset in 2014, and then we sort of, you know, got our coffee and ate our bagels, and it was out of mind because most of us didn't have family there. Maybe some of us had friends there, but it was sort of like we have other fish we're trying to fry right now. We are caught up in the Middle East. We're caught up in, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan and everything, and we sort of forgot. But what you'll see is the Ukrainians never stopped fighting. That picture is from 2014 when the Russian tanks rolled in. And I love that, as horrible as it is, there's something about that level of defiance. You know, I'd like to think that I would be that defiant person. I don't know. I might be somewhere in a basement <coughs> going, but you look at the Ukrainians and they have centuries of being defied. Okay, I've got the hook. I can do one more slide. One more slide. Okay, so just real quickly, what you need to remember is in, in 14, they took the Crimean, they took two provinces of the Ukraine. You move on down through, notice in 2014 September, NATO confirmed that Russian troops were there, heavy military was entering eastern Ukraine. And yet, in 2014, still, the elections elected pro-Western people. There's one more slide. And what you need to remember is that, you know, you have Putin in 18 saying that they're going to open a bridge linking southern Russia to the Crimea. The Ukraine says that's not legal. You've got the church in Constantinople allowing Ukraine to set up its own Orthodox Eastern Church so that it's not under the domination of the Russian Church. And you have in 19 Zelensky being elected as a free, democratically elected president who's part of what he campaigned on was, we will resist. And that's where we are today. And you see him resisting. You know, Ukraine's application to join NATO was withdrawn. It was not withdrawn by the Ukrainians. It was withdrawn by the Russian government. And the Ukrainians had no course. And what NATO has to decide, and we don't know because none of us want troops in a ground war. You know, we, we made some promises as the United States to Ukraine when they separated at the end of the Soviet Union era and about their nuclear weapons and everything, they gave up their weapons. Many of them came to Europe. And in return, we pledged to support them. But what does that mean? How is that going to work? I don't have a good answer for you. But I know that the Ukrainian people right now are looking, saying, we were promised help. Is someone going to help us with something other than prayers and good thoughts? I don't know the answer to that. But I will tell you that the news is going to be focused on that region. And it's probably not going to just be Ukraine in the days ahead. It's going to be other regions. It's when you start reassembling the Russian Empire, which is what Putin wants to do, then anything that was originally part of it is fair game. And that will be interesting to see what it looks like. By the way, just to give you a little bit of insight, and then I promise I'm hushing. Go on YouTube tonight. Putin, early on in his presidency, had a, a rock group in Russia of young women that he encouraged to do a song about him. And it's basically called, I Want a Man Just Like Putin. 
And it is, oh. I mean, it is, and it's pictures of Putin with his shirt off, pictures of Putin with a tie on, all these sorts of things. I mean, it is absolutely hilarious, but I'm telling you, he, he enjoys that demagoguery. Oh, sir, I'm so sorry. It's our, uh, no, no, that's okay. I, I thought there for a moment that I was being spoken to. <laughs> no, yeah. Not divine intervention. Well, you know, I've always been amazed that when the Lord spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, he simply said, here I am, Lord, because I would have been going, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> but anyway, um, I don't have an answer for you, but I will tell you, if history is a predictor of where we are today, it is a predictor of where we will be tomorrow. And Russia has aims and has historically always had aims at being the most dominant power in the world. Um, that, that honor has shifted through times. There was a time when Spain was dominant. There was a time when Great Britain was dominant. There was a time France was the dominant power on the continent for Western world, which would include Eastern Europe. The United States, we always said the second half of the 20th century was the U.S. century. I don't know what the answer is. What will be interesting is if ever the bear and the dragon get into a fight. Yeah. That will be if interesting. What? The bear, China. Russia and China, oh. if ever, because they are both based on Marxist philosophy, but they're on Maoist Marxism versus Leninist Marxism. And Putin will tell you he is still a part of communist. It'll be interesting to see what happens. And I'm stopping and hushing, and maybe that gives you some idea of historical Russia. It, it is 6.30, but, um, you know, uh, we, we can have at least five minutes to, okay. make, to do some okay, questions. We'll lock the doors. I noticed in the paper this morning, this is Gorbachev's 91st birthday today. It is. I didn't know he was still with us. Yeah. It, well, he has been very quiet. You know, there was a lot of concern when Putin came back to power that perhaps Gorbachev would yeah, disappear. Yeah, because he is a remnant of the past, and he's a remnant of a more hopeful, more open Russia. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a summons of your lecture tonight already on YouTube? So we can put it to you I think they were recording it, and it will be. And, and they have my slides, and I have told them that they can post those, too, for those of you who want to be able to go back and look. Because we didn't talk about, you know, how devastated Russia was at the end of World War I with the German peace treaty with, between Germany and Russia when they lost a third of their people, a third of their land, 60% of their national. I mean, there are just all these sorts of things that Russia has made a list of how the West really doesn't want them to come to power, which then justifies their petulant behavior. That might have been an opinion, I'm sorry. Justifies their behavior. Yeah, what do you make of uh, Putin threatening uh, Sweden and Finland that if they join the NATO, dire consequences would happen? Well, you know, not only that, but when was the last time you all remembered Switzerland taking a position? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sort of looking at the Swiss and thinking, okay, the Swiss are under a of this. This should make us a little bit nervous. It's not the first time, but you know, the Russians had control of Finland for decades. So, you know, the Swedes and the Norwegians are probably looking going, oh, crud, but, yeah. you know. Well, uh, why don't all these countries join NATO now? There's 30 countries in NATO currently. Well, there are, and there are those who don't want to pay the dues, but would like to be safeguarded and you know, there are those who say NATO has outlived its time. But, you know, we created NATO in 1948. The Russians responded with the Warsaw Pact, which is basically not existent four years later in 1952. And it's that, that armed alliance. I think if I were a small country in Europe, I'd be looking for somebody to be my big brother, and I would want it to be a Western ally. You know, I would want the Brits and the Americans in particular. I would want the French, too. As much as I have made jokes throughout history about the French fighting forces, the truth of the matter is they are there with us when we need them, except for that incident of airfying space, you know, on their way to Hussein. There was some concession made when the USSR broke up that we would not seek to have Ukraine as part of NATO. 
We never agreed to that. Did not. We did not. We did not. What we but did not. That? We did not say we would endorse their membership. What we said was in a very generic, "We will stand alongside you." I think the Ukrainians assumed that that meant military, economic aid, medical aid, whatever they needed. We were kind of waiting to figure out what that would mean. Because I don't know, how many of you are old enough to remember 1989? I mean, it was a pretty scary time. Because, you know, I remember the, the Berlin Wall fell on November the 9th that year. And I, I remember that only because it was my daughter's eighth birthday. And her party went out the window and instead we were celebrating the fall of the wall. She's never let me get over that. <laughs> but I remember thinking, who has the weapons? Where are the weapons? What do they have? Because for a long time, remember, we didn't know what they had. There was this escalating war of weapons, some of which was exaggerated, but we knew they were out there, but we didn't know where they were, where they were missile siloed, in which one of those ethnic minority regions who had control of them. They were not all within the boundaries of the nation of Russia. It was a pretty scary time. I was old enough to be frightened anyway. So is it frightening today? I think it is. You know, I think any time that we are watching what has been historically now for 30 years, a sovereign nation invaded by another nation, and the world is all concerned that we watch it happening because we're not exactly certain what we need to do, it's pretty scary. You know, if Ukraine falls, what happens to Belarus? What happens? Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania will be the first grab. They are terrified. I, they I don't blame for this at the start. <laughs> well, and, and I would have been too because the language since 2012 has been that historically those were not independent provinces, and by historically it means not until the last three or four centuries. I mean, you know. Uh, and I think they're terrified. And if I saw Russians in the Ukraine and I was Estonian, Latvian, or Lithuanian, I would be. I'd be sending my children out of the country. And maybe that's a good place to stop. Watch the news. If the Republic, my whole purpose in ever talking about history is we are a Republic. We depend on an enlightened, informed citizenry. You need to know what's going on in your world. And unfortunately, in a global society, it's not just what's happening in Chattanooga. It's not just what's happening in the Southeast. It's not even just what's happening in the US. You need to be informed. You need to make certain that you are voting. When's the primary? May 3rd, the general is in August. Your vote is your voice. I don't care who you vote for. I mean, I do sort of, but everyone's vote is their voice. And as Franklin said, we have a republic if we can keep it. And it depends on an engaged, informed society. And you all have demonstrated tonight you want to be informed, so bless you. Thank you for coming out. We're talking about doing something like this maybe once a month. So. Yeah.